Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets. Well, welcome to Conversations with Nikki, where we keep you entertained, informed, and inspired. I'm Nikki Seberini, and as always, it's a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'd like to welcome our syndication partner listeners. That's Eldos FM, Chai FM, Kawi FM, West Coast FM, MC 90.3 in Plettenberg Bay, Nisner FM, Wild Coast FM, Bay FM, and also our new syndication partner, um, all the way from the Northern Cape, Timoning FM. Welcome. So, again, thank you so much for the uh, emails, and uh, it's great to hear from you. I, I did post uh, this week uh, via social media that I was going to be talking to an expert in the field of parenting, and that if any of you had questions to ask this expert of ours, um, just to send uh, a message to me. And so thank you for the response, and I have selected three people that we'll be getting hold of during the show. And I'd like to do more of that. So you have an opportunity to interact with our guests. So once again, please do go to the website, www.conversationswithnikki.co.za. Nikki spelled N-I-K-I, and it's one word, Conversations with Nikki. Um, you can get all the podcasts of the show there, and also you can communicate with me. Or you can go to the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Conversations with Nikki. Um, if you like that page, then every time I post something, whether it's a request or whether it's a show, um, you will get that. Also, you can follow me on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Seberini. So, um, yeah, so thank you so much, and, and please do continue with the communication. I do love hearing from you. Also, I had a great response to last week's show, Looking at Adoption. Um, I'm glad that that was a show that uh, meant a lot to a lot of people, and I, I really do wish you all the very best if that is the option that you're looking at, and, and hopefully within a short period of time um, you're able to have the family that you have been dreaming about for, for many, many years. Yes. And speaking of families, this is, this is what the show really is about today. It's, it's, it's about parenting. And I mean, from a, from a personal point of view, I, I think that being a parent is, is possibly one of the toughest um, yet most rewarding jobs in the whole wide world. In fact, Sonia Tatt said, what children take from us, they give us. We become people who feel more deeply, question more deeply, hurt more deeply and love more deeply. I think that that says it all about parenting. So to tackle this life changing, wonderful, yet challenging topic is world-renowned psychologist and best-selling author Steve Bidolf, who's chatting to us all the way from Oz. So Steve, hi, welcome, and uh, thank you very much for taking time out to be on the show. Hello, Nikki. It's great to be able to talk there. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's fantastic that you have sold over 4 million copies, um, and I believe 32 languages uh, that the, 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 your book has been translated into. And I just wanted to start off by asking you, Steve, because if we go back many, many years to the days of um, Dr. Spock, I mean, he, he wrote this incredible baby and child care. It, it was a bestseller. Um, he he was one of the first pediatricians to study psychoanalysis, and he encouraged parents, in fact, to be more flexible, um, to be more affectionate, to treat children as individuals. It's almost as if that was a turning point. And here you have, um, with so many bestsellers and, and, as I said, translated to so many languages, what do you think, Steve? Is it, a, is it a, an extension of what Dr. Spock wrote about, or is it something completely new? What is it that's drawing parents to, to your books? Yes, well, I think um, Dr. Spock was a was a wonderful man, and his books were a turning point. And see, I was I was born in Yorkshire in England, and I, I recently told a BBC station that Yorkshire, when I was born there, was the world capital of negative parenting. Oh, really? And, um, and people loved their children, but they also oh, sorry, there's a little bit of an echo on the line. I don't know if you can help that, but the parents loved their children but they were always putting them down and and telling them they were no good and 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 so what Spock said was look it doesn't hurt to give kids a bit of affection every now and then mm -hmm. and and it's all right to to be kind to them now that sounds to us so obvious but but he he was the first one that and, and his book starts off with the 
the, the sentence, you know more than you think you know. And it's, so he's really reassuring parents. And what I always say too is, listen to other people, but always use your own judgment. And there's, there's way too many parenting books around and way too many experts. And, and listen to your heart. Um, only do the things that really feel right to you. Well, it's so interesting that you say that because you're right. I mean, you go and you, you walk into a bookstore and they're just shelves are packed with parenting books. What I find so interesting, Steve, is that anyone can have a child. You don't have to have any type of qualification. You don't have to write an entrance exam. Um, there's no test. You can just procreate. And I, I hear what you're saying about listen to your heart and, and, and go with your gut. But you give birth and you have this little human being um, who relies 100% on you and it really, really is incredibly daunting. Yes, that's right. And, and I think one of the things that I've, I've recently been doing some some big seminars in, in London with about 40 parents at a time. And what we do is we look at, say, the seminars that are about girls, we look at the five stages of girlhood, and then we look at how, for the mothers there, how they went in those stages. Because, for example, it's really great with little girls when they're between two and five to, to encourage them to be explorers mm -hmm. and get out in the mud and the dirt and the trees and and feel like they can go anywhere and do anything um, now the trouble is if you if, if when you're a little girl you're always told to stay neat and tidy and keep your clothes clean and that the world's a scary place and don't get any dirt on you um, it's very hard to just kind of relax on the inside when your daughter wants to play in the mud and so it is important to and it starts you on this journey of looking at your own childhood and what you got that you liked and what you got that you didn't like and and talk to other people and just gradually find your way to what's um, something that isn't just the result of passing on things from one generation to another. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It, it really does, Steve. Listen, I, I do apologize for the echo. We, we can't hear an echo on our side. On our side, the sound is good. So if it's really bad for you, let us know and we can always call you again. But I, I hope that you're okay with that slight echo. Let's see how we go. Thank okay. you. Fantastic, Steve. You know, you were talking about something that, that I think is quite interesting, you know, getting girls between the age of two and five who are exploring to go outside, get their hands dirty and really, really explore. And I do find, and, I, and I'm not sure what it was like um, during the Dr. Spock days, um, but I, I do find that parents are very concerned um, with germs and we have all these hygienic cleaners and, 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 I, and there are a lot of children, in fact, who don't want to get dirty, who, who are very uptight if their hands are dirty, if, if their feet are muddy. Is this a, I mean, if we look at nature nurture, I suppose we can bring up the question here, what, what is that? Is that a, just a new generation of kid? Is that the parent? who is, is passing on that kind of um, yes. neuroses. Well, what, what's, your, what's your take on that, Steve? Yes, well, I was listening today to a, uh, Australia's very best expert on, on allergies. And that she was being asked, why is it that so many children now have all these terrible allergies? They're, you know, they're everywhere. And she said that the most um, convincing theory that they have about this is that little children are not getting enough germs <laughs> and she says there's a stage little toddlers go through where they and every parent knows this because it drives you crazy where the toddler seems to be putting everything in their mouth uh, I can remember how the son putting dog poo in his mouth oh. when he was and just this <laughs> terrible moment and almost hosing him out you know <laughs> and you think how can they do that but it turns out this is a thing which babies do ch children do they they put everything into their mouth and the reason is, is that they have an instinctive knowledge that they need to expose themselves to as many substances and as many kinds of bacteria and things like that in order to wake up their immune system. And, and so children who grow up on farms and children who have pet animals at home have far better um, prevention of things like eczema and asthma and hay fever because their immune systems have been sort of kicked into action by the massive influx mm. of germs when they were toddlers mm. and it's a and it's so it, we've become far too hygienic mm. and um now that doesn't mean that you go drinking water with typhoid in it and there's plenty of people i know in africa and elsewhere that have still got too many germs in their environment but but in the extreme of affluent people it's it's we've gone way too far mm. and and 
I think all little toddlers, if they're allowed to, and if mum and dad don't get all uptight, they love, there's no better place to play than in mud. It's just the best stuff. <laughs> and so try and relax around that. Get a bit messy with your children. If they're a bit uptight, then just kind of work on it a bit with them and get a bowl of mud and, and make things out of it. And they'll pretty quickly loosen up. And, and there's even substances in dirt which fight depression and some bacteria that has gives off an antidepressant chemical. And so amazing things. <laughs> so well, dirt is a news. feminist issue, yes. <laughs> that's fantastic news. I can just imagine a lot of parents, as you said, playing the mud with your kids, shaking their heads, saying, well, maybe not. Um, Steve, you, I mean, you're a great advocator of, of a more affectionate way of parenting, connection, um, looking at role models and I, I'm going to start off focusing on raising boys because I, I find that I mean I'm, I myself have two boys and mm. I just find it so interesting how you divide a boy's life the stages his development into three stages uh, perhaps you can just quickly outline that and because I do want to talk about the importance of role models yes yes it, there's a very clear um delineation in boys and it's driven by hormones and you can see these hormones in the if, if you take sort of saliva samples from from little boys right through to big boys but from naught to six so from birth to the age of six little boys are very much in their mum's world mm. and and um, they're learning from their mum to to feel loved and secure and to love life um, and and so d fathers can do a huge amount with little children, but relative to mum, they're like light entertainment, mm. <laughs> whereas mum is the main deal. But around about the age of six, and I've talked to mums right there in South Africa and like in many countries of the world, everyone observes this, about the age of six, little boys start to really head for their dad. Mm. And it's like they are, if you can make this mental picture, Nikki, it's like they're holding mum's hand, mm. but they're looking at dad yeah. and they want to be like dad and follow him around. And we know there's a testosterone increase in little boy's bloodstream just before that stage comes along. But whatever it is, it's, it's like they've suddenly realized I'm going to be a man and I better start studying for the part. <laughs> and if you haven't got a dad at home, people listening, then often a granddad or a stepdad or an uncle doesn't matter as long as there's some caring man and then that that stage the the, 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 the stage when fathers are uppermost goes to about the age of 14 mm -hmm. now at the age of 14 boys have a testosterone surge of about 800 percent I'll just let that sink in with a listener sure. that's a, that's, a, that's the that's most huge. you'll ever have and what it does and yet when I have a large audience in front of me, everyone sort of groans for that. And we, we say that a 14-year-old boy will argue with a road sign. And so <laughs> at 14, boys and their dads, even if they've been really close, some tension starts to come in. They begin to be sort of stroppy with each other. And because this is the age when the boy's programming is that he knows this is this is in... Through, through our long history as hunter-gatherers, this was when you became an adult. And, and so the boy wants to push away from his dad, but he's far from ready. If you think of any 14-year-olds, you mm. know, they're far from ready to be... It's a terrible idea. They're, they're, they're crazy. And so what comes in from 14 to 21 is what boys need is mentors. And mentors are preferably people that mum and dad have kind of put into their life chosen them carefully it can be you know a school teacher or scout leaders and guitar and you know we say don't don't send them to kev's karate college unless you like the look of kev <laughs> because you're wanting because these are the people that they'll start to base their manhood yeah. on mm. and and so a great thing that people listening is to dads go away with your boys during their teens with other fathers and their boys and go camping and go to, to the surf, go to a concerts and things. So your son meets other men and he'll base his broadening sense of his masculinity by having a bit, I want to be a bit like that man. He's kind of artistic and that man's really good with kids, you know, and this man's a scientist and, and maybe, maybe dad's 
you know, an accountant or a lawyer or something. It's good, but it's not enough for that boy. Does, does that make sense, mm. Nikki? But Steve, I mean, this sounds, I mean, it's great. And I think in an ideal world where you have a mother and you have a father and you have grandparents and your child has, you know, perhaps goes to scouts or whatever it is, it's, it's absolutely perfect. But that's not always the reality. I mean, if we look in South Africa, Steve, we have so many, for example, child-headed households, which is a real, real tragedy. Yes. We have have um, we have a problem where there are many young boys who are who grow up and they they simply don't have fathers in their lives yeah. at all. So you're you're talking about that important stage between six and fourteen where they do not have these male role models, these male figures. N never mind the role model from fourteen onwards. So I suppose what I'm alluding to, Steve, is what happens when it doesn't work out like that. What what happens when the right people who play an integral part during those stages are simply not there yes well this is this is what we observed throughout the world in the 20th century even people who had dads, their dads were often very remote and a bit, a bit you know judged sort of harsh and distant and this this is the biggest wound in the human race mm. is, is the, the loss of healthy masculinity hmm. especially in, in the lives of and certainly in, in women's lives but in children's lives especially and and what happens with that lack is that boys go looking for it in any way they can. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's a, you know, if a if a 12 year old boy doesn't get that, he'll look. Maybe he'll follow a 14 year old boy around. Yeah. And so that's when you get gangs, and when you get people doing terrible things in groups, and and the, because the get the the 14 year old isn't able to be a, a, st a stable or sensible mentor his hormones are still going crazy and so um, boys looked in the wrong places for how to base their masculinity um, and so I can't fix this mm. but I, I think at least we've sh we can shine a big bright light on it because we know that the way to turn boys lives around is to is to get the men who are off on the side who don't have a role and don't really know what to do and this is Nikki this has been my life's work yeah. you know I've spent 25 years touring the world my single most goal was to get the men to step up to the line mm. and so um, we do know there are encouraging signs um, today's generation of men have treble the amount of time they spend with their sons in in one generation we've we've increased that by threefold sure. young dads are so much better at this mm. but but you're right in in fatherless families and in um child-headed families that this is a terrible mm. lack and um and what's happening around the world is people are getting men together and saying look it doesn't have to be your own son perhaps you're a 25 year old young man who works in a bank or works in a mine or a factory be a mentor. would you like to go mm. go to the school or go to a family or join the YWCA Big Brother program and be there for a little boy yeah. Yeah, I hear that. Um, Steve, I, I put out a message um, to listeners saying, you know, I'm going to be talking to you and does anyone have questions? And I had quite an overwhelming response and I just selected a few. So I have Laura on the line. She's from Johannesburg um, and she has a question for you. Laura, are you there? I am. Thank you, Nikki. Laura, please do go ahead. Um, Steve's listening to, to your question. Hi, thank Laura. You. Hi, Steve. And I love your book, Raising Boys. I've used so much from it. So thank you so much. And continue to work. Steve, I have two boys, a six-year-old and a ten-year-old, and um, I think two issues here, Steve. We're having sibling rivalry at the moment, where they are arguing, fighting. Um, they love one another to death, but there's also moments where there's smacking involved as well. They smack one another. Um, and also, my, my son, I could say, is a preteen. He's getting to a stage where he's, he's pretty mouthy at the moment with me. And, you know, we you set the boundaries, but he pushes the boundaries, and you take away the privileges, and you do all those things. Um, but Steve, I'm just finding I'm not winning. So you take away the iPad, you take away the TV, and, you, and, and, so, and, and all of a sudden it's just become, okay, well, mom's taking away the iPad, and, you know, and that gets taken away, so we follow through on our word. Mm. But then still this, I'm just, he's almost talking at me, not to me. So we'll be sitting doing homework, and then you're trying to help, you're trying to guide, and then it's this, it's like this, this monster almost, if I can use that term, comes out um, and, and I raise my voice and I then start to kind of build up this, this 
there's anger, there's frustration, mm. and again, it's, then it's setting the boundaries and the privileges taken away. So I'm not sure what else to do with the disciplining at this point, Steve. Maybe you have some insight for me. Okay. Now, Laura, I should explain that I'm not a, a really a good person for quick fixes. I, um, I, if a family therapist, I'd get your whole family and I'd probably spend six weeks getting to know you yes. um, because there are many factors in this. But if I can, can I just answer in general terms and you can take or leave what I say? Would that be okay? That would be absolutely wonderful, Steve. Thank That's, you so much. Yes, that, that if you're looking at the age of your oldest, you mentioned that he's 10, and so he's smack in the middle of the father phase. And I'm guessing that you've got a husband, is that right? We actually are divorced. We are living oh. with my, my parents. But father, he's oh. honestly a huge role. We have a wonderful relationship. Um, there's, we, you know, we talk about things, Dad, there, um, at least four days a week. He comes and he spends time with the boys and he has them every alternate weekend. So Dad's around and we both try and discipline in the same way. We discuss, yes. we discuss our disciplining techniques and we're on the same page with it. Yes. So you're doing, I mean, that's congratulations to you because being able to, to, to be divorced and, and still get along well is a huge achievement. So you're in that... 20% of divorced people who have been mature about it, which is really great. Um, and the thing is, what we'd recommend is, if, if Dad is still in the picture, is that the 10-year-old um, is, is, is still reacting to the family situation and the changes, and that for him to go off on overnight trips with his dad, um, the 6-year-old doesn't get to go because... You know, if you explain it to them, it will be when you're older, you can too. Yeah. But if the 10-year-old and his dad start going away on overnight trips together, then what happens is that the 10-year-old and, da and his dad start to get um, to a place where they can talk about the things that are upsetting him. Yeah. And just and the dad can start to talk to him about you have to respect your mum. Yeah. Because what we seem to find with with boys learning respect is that the dads have to show it and teach them to do that does, does, now does that make sense mm. to you i'm not sort of talking out of out of top of my hat no you're not steve you actually are you on track because we, and in fact dad does often say you know he talks to the boys and he'll say you need to talk with respect to mommy mommy's you know we we, we want to develop a family where there's love and there's kindness mm. and there's caring because then it obviously it gets it's spread out you, you take that with your skills and you use it in the real world and, and that is what we try and install in the boys but i think it's also an awkward age because he is a preteen he'll be 11 very soon the hormones i think are kicking in there's a lot of changes happening at the moment i can see it yes mm. I, yes i i very much think that this is really that you're actually doing everything right and your husband is too, and this is just the kind of that it's a stressful time for the family, and 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 it's 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 just that usually kids kids will show the stresses by being cranky, mm. and and that, that um, as it gets more settled, and it also if you can um, just sort of have time for yourself so that you don't you know that you're kind of a bit more casual about it all, and maybe let him do his own homework and and be a little bit more out of his hair um that that you'll all just start to it's not a matter of a magic wand but it'll just gradually calm down mm -hmm. um so I, I think you know there's plenty of mums listening who are thinking gee she's doing all these great things and <laughs> and so you're really on the right track and just to stay with it thank you laura thank you so thank much you. for, you, for the question it's a great show thank you bye bye laura thank you steve um Thank you for that. I, I think that also perhaps with, with the divorce that Laura was talking about, that that maybe would, would complicate issues. You, you spoke about how important it is for the father to draw a boundary or a line in teaching his son um, how he can, what is and is not acceptable when addressing um, his mother. Is, yeah. that, I mean, is, that, is that a phase as well, Steve? Um, yes, I mean... Um it's it's that classical thing which probably everyone listening to the program remembers from their childhood when you dad comes thundering in and says dad, you know don't speak to your mother like that mm. and um and it's not it's not as much that it's not so it's not like the cavalry arrives and the dad comes and thumps the boy or anything like that it's just that um that women really often do the hard stuff mm. the, the woman is the one who does the you know making sure they clean up and 
get their school things ready and and sometimes dads are a bit like a a bit like a kid around the house and they're just the good time guy <laughs> and and so and that's partly because the way we work the, the, the guys are exhausted when they come home they don't want to really do anything heavy at all but it's the fact that um, what the, what a teenager needs to see is mum and dad standing side by side very close and and that the, 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 the dad is really on her side and, and that they're standing together and saying, you're a great kid, but we're going to keep on raising you. You're not finished okay. yet. Mm-hmm. And, and for a woman to be able to just relax into that and feel like, oh, you know, um, I'm not on my own and I don't have to do it all myself is, is a huge thing. So the unity um, and speaking the same language as parents is very important. Yes, mm. and often, I mean, don't think, it's not that you've got to always agree, you mm. hardly ever do. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, but, but you don't undermine each other. Mm. Um, Steve, I mean, we've, we've just really just started talking about raising boys, but you have just written um, Raising Girls, Helping Your Daughter to Grow Up Wise, Warm and Strong. And, and you talk about the worry, the caution today um, that, that, that young girls face, um, that girls um, have premature sexualization through, through media exposure. So the question is, um, Steve, so uh, what, what girls are going through and experiencing today, is it very, very different um, from, from what was happening, let's say, 15, 20 years ago? Yes, it certainly is. And if I can explain a bit about that, Nikki. Please. When I wrote Raising Boys, um, which was 15 years ago now, girls were going great. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was worried about boys. Boys were three times more likely to die and nine times more likely to go to jail. And girls were just flying along. And so I assumed girls were taken care of. And, and But about six or seven years ago, the mental health figures with girls suddenly took an enormous plunge and it started in the United States and it spread across the world and so that when I first started as a psychologist maybe one in 30 girls had psychological problems but today and it's the same in South Africa as everywhere else about one in five girls will have a serious psychological problem before she's 21. That's frightening and why why is it happening? It's, it's what what we think is going on is that there's a sort of a, a sort of a perfect storm in that the main the main one is what you alluded to which is that to, as one parent put it to me that 14 is the new 18 mm-hmm. and that girls are, are being forced to grow up way too fast and you know so we've got eight-year-olds dieting very most eight-year-olds are worried most eight-year-old girls worry about their weight mm-hmm. um, 10 and 12 year olds are just thinking you've got to have a boyfriend and, and you've, you've got to be sexy and everything like this and um, the the reason for that is that corporations and marketing um, departments about eight, eight or nine years ago and I've actually spoken to marketers who told me that they did this rather shamefacedly they mm-hmm. decided that the softest target in the world was the eight-year-old girl and if they could get her to be anxious about friendship and anxious about looks and fitting in and belonging, they could sell her all kinds of stuff for decades. You know, if they could get her hooked onto diet foods or mm. things like, you know, brands of clothing. And so they went after the, the prepubescent girl. And so that the, the consequence of that today is that girls are anxious about things that they wouldn't have even thought about 10, mm. 20 years ago. And, there's, and, there's, and it's partly marketing, it's partly that we watch a lot of television now. All the women on television are, are incredibly gorgeous and, and, and look sexy and act sexy in rock videos. Mm. That's what women do. And so you're, I imagine, Nikki, you're like me, you're from, uh, from the feminist era and you really For believe sure. in women's rights. And, and, and it's making us all just, just groan because it's mm. back back where it was that women are just decorations again Mm. and so uh, and we're seeing this happen to the girls and what's happening is that they get anxious they develop eating disorders or they um, they act out in the sense of drinking too much having sex very young at 12 or 13 and um, and and we have this sudden epidemic of, of, of mental health problems 
Uh, I'm just looking at, uh, in, in raising girls, you talk about the five stages, zero to two, safe and loved, two to five years, exploring, five to ten years, people skills, ten to fourteen, finding um, her soul, and fourteen to eighteen, adulthood and, and learning to take responsibility. And if you, you just spoke about girls at the age of ten and twelve, between ten and twelve, who are looking to be in relationships and who are feeling that they need to be sexy and they're, they're under pressure. And, and, if, and if that coincides with the very important stage that you've highlighted, which is finding her soul, I think that that's, it, it just tells us where the problem lies, when she should be finding her soul. This is where she's you know, very unsure sexually and in relationships. Steve, we're going to take a break. We will be back in a moment and we'll continue with this fascinating conversation. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za well, if you have just tuned in, welcome. This is Conversations with Nikki, and I am Nikki Seberini. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for tuning in and also welcoming our syndication partner listeners. Of course, our brand new syndication partner, Timaning FM in the Northern Cape. We also have Bay FM. We have Wild Coast FM, Neisner FM, Plettenberg Bay, that's MC 90.3, West Coast FM, Kaui FM, Chai FM, and Eldos FM. I have the very fascinating um, best-selling author and psychologist, world-renowned psychologist, Steve Bidolf, on the line. We're talking about raising children. Uh, Steve has written Raising Boys, which is beautiful been around a million copies worldwide bestseller also raising girls his new book um, secrets of happy children I think his first book was manhood and I think that must have been fascinating unfortunately I haven't read it um, yet men looking at themselves in the world um, and uh, I put it out there and I said if you have any questions please do let me know and uh, we'll get Steve to answer those questions so I looked at three people and uh, we're going to be talking to I think Mandy from PE in just a moment Moment. But Steve, let's continue. Welcome back. We were talking about girls. We were talking about how times have changed for girls. You, you are, of a, are a great advocate in role models um, and having mentors in children's lives. And, and we just spoke about, I mean, look at the role models of young girls today when they switch on TV and they look at these, these music videos as we spoke about. What, what can parents be doing? I mean, parents don't want to be the ones who always say to their children, this is not a appropriate that's not appropriate switch off the TV change the way you dress don't especially going into teenage years don't girls just want to be like their friends well they do and um, and it's probably um, not the best thing to wait till they're teenagers and because one of the things that we that we, we realize now is that there is this kind of flood of media but it starts incredibly young and perhaps the damage is happening at around about the age of two or three. Mm -hmm. And so and I, I remember, Nikki, my, my daughter's 22 now, but I remember this incident when she was about three years old and we were just sitting around in the evening and she, the television was going and, and she looked to, up to us and said, from, she was playing with toys and she just looked up to us and said, isn't that great, mummy? That lady's husband will love her now that she's lost weight. Mm. And, and she was and we three. Just kind of double taken, mm. realized that there are a lot of diet ads on Australian television. I don't know if you have them in in South Africa, but um, she hadn't even been looking at the television. But she'd heard this diet ad. This lady had lost weight and was giving her husband a big cuddle. And so a little three-year-old was already making that conclusion: you have to be thin to be loved. Mm. Now we really changed our television practices after that, mm. and and so. It's more to do with early days, and um, but the things also that come in is that we've looked at girlhood, and what we've realised is that the time that girls spend with older women has been reduced by about 80% in the last 50 years. Girls used to wander around to their auntie's house, and they used to hang around with mum, and would have all of her friends around a lot, and and so that there were lots more older women in the lives of teenage girls. And, and those older women were very savvy and they would talk to, you know, and aunties can 
talk to girls in ways that their mothers can't. And they can say, you know, so what's going on, you know, with you and this boy, you know, mm. and, 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 and they ask those deep questions like, you know, what are your dreams for your life? And um, what, you know, what do you really want to do with your life? And, and, and I really encourage people listening who've got nieces uh, or men who've got nephews is start having them come to your house and sleep over and take them out for lunch once a month mm. and have these conversations because if the girl has an anchor into the adult world, um, then their peer group, they're good for friendship, but they're not good for advice, you know. They're as silly as you are. Mm. And so um, girls need, to, 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 we've got to really ramp up the older women in the lives of our daughters. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, I, I do have um, someone else who had a question for you. Um, it's Mandy from Port Elizabeth. Um, Mandy, are you there? Hi. Hi, Nikki. Hi, hi, hi Mandy. Um, um, thanks um, for taking my call. Um, I have a, a quite a different scenario, a different um, concern for my, um, my teenage son. He's 15. But people seem to be talking a lot about worrying about what their children or their teenagers are getting up to and where they're going and where they shouldn't be going. And in my case, it's more a case of concern that my son isn't going out, that he seems to be very happy to stay at home. He never really goes out. He's, he, he goes to school. He does well at school. He's a diligent kid. He works hard. He plays sport. On the surface, he seems really happy in the sports team. He seems like part of the, part of the team. And yet when, we, when he comes home, that's it. it. There's never an arrangement. He never goes off. There's never an attempt to socialize outside of school hours. And as a mother, I, I have to um, wonder whether, you know, whether this is, you know, just okay in the personality that he is or whether maybe it's, you know, through lack of courage and one could perhaps help him to, like, to, to, to find the courage to perhaps pick up the phone and ask, you know, ask a friend over or it's difficult as a mother whether to put pressure on him or whether to just let it be. Sure. Um, well, Mandy, of course, with all the, uh, apart from all the other advice I was giving with Laura earlier about, about the role of dads, um, I think that I wouldn't be too worried. Um, I think that boys go through quiet stages and, 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 and are, are sometimes some, some boys are much shyer than others. And I'd be worried if he wasn't playing sport at school or didn't, you know, didn't like school. Does he, does he, is he, does he say that he's happy at school? Yes, he does seem to be happy. I think he's, he's very comfortable there. You know, he's found a place which is comfortable and, um, you know, he's, there's never any issue about going to no. school. Well, look, that's the main thing because, you see, compared with our day, school is, is quite exhausting these days. And, um, and if you're a, a sort of a, a, a kind of a person who's wired up to be quite smart and, and bright and sensitive to your environment, it's, it's actually a bit of an overload. And yeah. there's a lot of physical changes going on at 15. A lot of, you know, it's, it's emerging into, into young manhood. And I'd be inclined to just relax about it for a year or two. Um, right. usually, usually what brings people out of this is, of course, is the amazing fascination with girls. And, yeah. and what makes boys start to get more social is, is that they're wanting to start to, to relate to the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever it is that they are interested in. And so... Yeah. Um, this is what brings us out of our shells. I was, I was a lot like your son, and and um, and look at me. I turn into a sort of <laughs> um, someone who can't stop talking. <laughs> and so um, my my gut feeling, of course, as I said, if you know, if you're worried about, you know, you always go and talk to a psychologist properly if you're really worried. But um, yes. but my gut feeling is just look, just relax about it. And the fact that he doesn't talk, like he's not a talker, he's very quiet, he just gets on with it, he doesn't like to answer questions, you know, as soon as you even mention something, mm. he feels, gets, um, gets very defensive and... Um, yes, yes. yes. Well, boys, find, boys find anxious mums really hard work <laughs> and, and, and um, they, start erecting, they start erecting walls almost straight away and, and so as long as he's still coming out to the kitchen and getting food, I'd, I'd be <laughs> relaxed about it. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate your work. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I have to chuckle to myself when you said that boys find anxious moms difficult to handle because moms are really quite anxious, aren't they? Um, I think the dads are just by nature more relaxed, and, and I suppose that's such a huge generalization, Steve. But it's always just trying to find the balance and always trying to give one's children the very best. Yes, and I, and I think... Um, when I do these talks anywhere on the radio in the world, it's always the mums who ring up, and and it's, I feel like they've been abandoned too much by the men, and and it's this is men's work to be getting these boys confidence and 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 things like that. Mm -hmm. If confidence is the issue, or if misbehaviour is the issue, I, I say, where's the dad, and and what's he doing? And I, no, I'm not saying that in Mandy's case, but but as a general picture in society. We, we need the men to be far more um, weighing in there with, the, with, the, with not just their own boys, but everyone's boys. Steve, I, I, I love what you say, and I, I find it very interesting that you've, you've been quite um, outspoken about delayed schooling. Um, that, that perhaps, and I think especially for boys, you, you feel that boys should only start school a little bit later. Now, we, we, again, I don't know what it's like in Australia. I think that they encourage moms to stay home for, for longer and obviously then be with the children. But again, living in South Africa, you have a lot of parents who are working and and uh, they have to get their children off to uh, a daycare as, as, as young as possible. What kind of impact is that having on our kids today? Okay, well, um, there's t sort of two questions rolled in there together. Yes. <laughs> and daycare is one question, but the one I'm most interested in at the moment is that um, because there's really strong research coming through in, in Australia and in the UK and I imagine in South Africa, a lot of kids start school at about four or five. And what's happened is that the nature of schooling has changed a lot. It's far more serious now. And what I call sit-down schooling mm. starts off straight away. And people have got books and they've got pencils and they're, and they're doing lessons at five years of age. Now, little boys develop in a different way to girls in that girls at about the age of four, they get very good control of their fingers and what's called fine motor skills and little girls if you've got a little girl at home she'll be drawing stuff and making little things with her hands whereas boys develop their gross motor skills which is their arms and legs um, first of all and then when they're about six they finally get to, to wiring up their fingers at the end of those arms and legs and so the average boy doesn't get good motor control of his fingers till for about a year longer than mm. the average girl now um, if they're in a classroom and they're having to sit still and be good, then that little boy's body is calling out to him and saying, move me, move me. And um, any men listening will remember this in school. It hurts. It just hurts to have to sit still. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, that little boy just kind of can't, you know, he knows he's supposed to be good, you know, and sit still. But after a while, it's just, oh, I just can't do it. And he jumps up or he knocks something over and he's, he's in trouble. Um, and so... School has become very unfriendly to boys. Mm. And one of the things that, that has been found in European countries who are much more advanced, Germany and Scandinavia, they don't start school till six or seven. And, and yet their kids are far better in their skills. There are no differences in literacy skills between boys and girls in Germany. There's a huge difference in, in, in all the English-speaking countries. And we think that we are actually turning boys off learning by putting them in too soon. Now, just this year, a study was brought out that's showing that actually it's too young for girls as well. Okay. And that we should, if we have to go to school, then it should be just creative play and no sitting down do, having to do lessons and sums and reading and things like that. It should be a place where kids enjoy the, the joys of of an enriched play environment um, with stories and, and things, but but we, we have to slow down this pressured thing. Now we're not as bad, of course, as the Japanese or the Chinese who are you know learning languages at three and things like that. So we're we're not the worst in the world, but but we have really damaged boys in pushing them in too soon, and they feel that school is a girl's domain mm -hmm. and it's a girl place, and and so they. Um, they don't. They don't thrive, and they're just not happy.
I must say, what you're saying definitely resonates with me, and I, I'm wondering how many listeners are nodding their heads in agreement and, and feel the same way. But having said that, Steve, when they look at research and they look at the development of a child's brain, it sh I mean, the, when, when a child is young and between the ages of um, two and four, isn't that when they would be absorbing and making more of the information and the skills that are coming to them? Um, now, that sounds really good on the surface, <laughs> but um, it's it, because it's true. Kids do learn really well at that age, and but the way they learn is not through rote learning. Uh -huh. And um, I'm part of a big campaign. If people go on my Steve Bidoff's Raising Girls Facebook page, it's just just look, Google Steve Bidoff's Raising Girls, and and it, there's a Facebook page. Um, and and we, about three weeks ago, we put this research up because there's this whole movement, and it's I'm part of this in the in the UK of child development people who are saying that um, that we're messing up children's learning because they because play is how they learn, okay, I like and they that. are far more um, um, they learn far. For instance, you know, if we had lessons in walking, we would have kids who were crippled, and. If we had lessons in how to speak, um, we'd have kids who were, couldn't speak mm. because they learn better in their own time, in their own way. Mm. And, and there's nothing more um, educational than um, a mum who chatters to her little baby um, or a, a dad who reads stories at bedtime because what, they, what you learn from that is that this is fun. You know, I love when Dad comes to my room at night time and he reads a story and, and Dad's going mad. He's just written the, you know, he's just read The Hungry Caterpillar for the 900th <laughs> time, you know. And, and but it's, it's associated with love and fun. Mm, learn and through so, play. Yes, and so boys learn to love reading because they, they, they do it, you know, it's because it's fun. Mm. Dad does it, he does funny voices, you know, and, and mum chatters, uh, you know, to me and talks about what she's doing. But that's the way that human beings have learned for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm. There, there were no schools in the, um, in, in the hunter-gatherer society, um, but the kids were so smart. Yeah. You know, they could recognize 200 plants and they, they could, you know, a six-year-old could look after the baby. Um, they were much more intelligent than our children. Listen, I think it's a very interesting take, and I encourage our listeners, you know, if they feel the same way, to go visit uh, that Facebook page. You talk about the Steve Bidoff Raising Girls, and uh, you highlight it there. Is that what you're saying, Steve? Yes, so we've got two pages. Um, yeah. One, one it's called Steve Bidoff's Raising Girls, and one called Steve Bidoff's Raising Boys that we've only just put up a okay. couple of days ago. And so any, it's mostly... Um, research and also <laughs> put funny pictures there as well like everyone else on Facebook okay. <laughs> put funny pictures but there's the, the best research if anything comes up around the world we put it up there so you can see what's going on super now listen a little bit earlier you said you know that usually it's the moms and and dads need to be doing more so I'm delighted to say that we have a dad um, on the line who has a question for you which is which was you know when I got the question I was very happy with that so um, mm. I have Lawrence from Joburg um, on the line hi Lawrence um, Please, will you direct your question to Steve? Yes, thank Good you. G'day, Lawrence. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? Really great. Good. Okay, I've got a pretty unique situation. I've got a 14-year-old daughter who, about seven months ago, uh, just before she turned 14, she came to live with me full-time because her mother immigrated. And uh, I'm not sure um, where where her behavior fits between a normal adolescent teenager versus a child who's like now living full-time with her dad. And I'm not sure like what is normal or what is maybe issues related to the move, and I'd like to get a bit of advice on that. Sure. Um, now, when you say that there are issues, what kinds of things are you worrying about? Uh, I, just, I just get a sense that she is a lot less warm and interactive than she used to be, and... Um, just seems a little bit distant compared to when she was younger and I you know maybe that's just normal teenage stuff or maybe there's I don't know some issues about you know living with one parent now I'm not yes yeah, yes well um the good news is that this sounds exactly like a 14 year old girl um uh, being distant and and um not as communicative it's a terrible sad thing for parents when this adolescence sort of really kicks in 
that they do want to have their own private world. And there's a, there's a whole chapter about this in, in, in the Racing Girls book. But, but I don't want to just minimise it as um, just saying that that's just normal because you are in a situation that's very unusual. Um, and, and you're a dad raising a teenage girl on your own and that's, that, that's great and I'm, I'm very proud of you for doing that. Um, but at the same time, um, she's having a, she's got a big gap in, in a, at a time when she needs female role models quite intensely. And so something that it might be really helpful is to, to see if in the, in the social world you have around you, or even if it takes some professional help, um, that there's someone there for her who's, who's a woman who's preferably even older than her mom, um, that, that spends time with her. Is, is, is there anything like that going on at the moment? I have a girlfriend who she looks up to, and she sees her maybe twice a week, and uh, she's quite happy to hear when she's coming around and that. Um, and other than that, I suppose aunties and a granny and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Oh, that's good. And so you're not, you're not sort of living far from relatives. There are relatives there and, and they care about her. Yeah, pretty much. That's great. Well, look, I, I, I mean, I'm less inclined to worry. I think that, I mean, it's tough on a girl when her, her actual mum isn't, isn't on, on the scene. And, you know, if, if you could magic wand that, that wouldn't have happened. But, but sometimes it does. And so what she's, she, the very strong message that she has is that she has a dad who loves her and, and is, is there for her, and that's, that's a brilliant thing for a girl to have. And, and, and that she's got other, other women in her life. I think that you've, you've got all of the ducks lined up there and it's and it's doing the best you can. And so it, it, it might be that she does go quiet for, you know, six months to a year just getting used to things but she's not out of the normal range. Most 14-year-old girls are a bit hard to get on with. And so um, some of that is just the, the age. And, and I think you're doing everything you can, Lawrence. No, thanks, thanks very much. That helps uh, clear things up a lot. Thank and you, Lawrence. Just, and including being brave enough to ring up on the radio. So I think it is, we've got a first-class dad here. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you very much. I agree with you, Steve. It's lovely to, to hear from, from a dad and to hear that, that, that perspective. Um, Steve, we, we, we spoke about the early learning, which I really, really think is very interesting. And I did also bring into that question um, sending your young baby off to daycare um, from a young age. What, what are your thoughts around that? And bearing in mind that for some parents it's an absolute necessity. So is there the right way of, of handling something like this? Yes. I mean... Basically, um, daycare is something that um, was invented for parents. And um, if, we were, if you were designing things for kids, you have what's called preschool, and it comes in about the age of three and a half, and it's about maybe three short days a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we've worked all over the world to try and have preschool provision for kids. But what the studies have found is that um, you know, three short days a week seems to be the very best for advancing their learning. But if you go longer than that, then there's a, an indicator which is called cortisol. And cortisol, you get if you get a little bit of saliva from a, a child's mouth and you send it to the lab, you get it measures it's a stress hormone and it shows the amounts of stress that kitties are having. And for instance, it, it sort of starts low in the morning and it kind of goes up as the day goes on, which is a little bit like what <laughs> what happens with parents mm -hmm. as well, and and um, but kitties who are in daycare centres um, tend to to have higher levels of cortisol, and it suppresses their immune system, and if it's very severe, it even suppresses their growth hormones, and so it's a kind of a a situation that you try and minimise. You know, if you can, you know, wait till at least they're two then that's a whole lot better than starting at one. Mm -hmm. We had a, a daycare center here in Australia that admitted a six-day-old baby. It's six days old, and mm. its mum was a law student, and she had to get back to, to study. And, um, and there was a kind of an outcry about that because that was just really, really sad. And, and so babies are best to be around someone who loves them. And so... If dad can, if, if mum's got a great job, maybe dad can do it. 
oh, that's better. You know, if mum and dad can't do it, maybe grandma can do it. Um, maybe a nanny can do it. And that it has to be someone who, to who, for whom that child is special. Um, if you're in daycare, then you're wanting a ratio of one carer to three toddlers. Now, in Australia and England, that's often five to ten, you know, five to ten toddlers with one carer. Mm-hmm. And there's no way. And we've had studies of the what are called the joint attention sequences, which is the time when a kitty says, you know, hi, mum, you know, do you love me? And, and the mum says, yes, I do. And the child says, well, I'm just checking you. They don't use those exact words, but mm-hmm. it's kind of like they check in. Um, and the kids do that about 80 times a day um, if they're a toddler at home. But in a daycare center, that happens about five times a day because kids learn, well, the care is pretty busy, you know, and, and just won't pick up on that. And now that teaches you to be hardy and to get by and be independent, but, but there's a stress cost. And so um, it's, it's okay. Your child won't turn into a monster by going to daycare, but it just isn't first rate. Mm. And, and so I don't want to put this onto women. I think that um, maybe it means dads should spend more time at home um, and share it so we can both have careers. There's a whole lot of things to be worked out here. Um, but that's the honest picture and the research picture. Um, is you can use it, but it's it, it's not ideal. Mm. Uh, so for those parents though who do go and then they collect their child from daycare or whatever it is, the the question of quality versus quantity um, in terms of younger from little babies through to toddlers, is it what's important here? You you, you said that. The, the little child, the little baby, the toddler needs to be with someone who loves them. They're checking in all the time. Mm-hmm. But let's look at this quantity versus quality in terms of time. Yes. Okay. Now, quality, we could have a... Nikki, I'm going to have to come back on your program because we could have a whole <laughs> we program We need another on hour. <laughs> and, but um, we, people, when they think of quality time, they think, oh, gee, I better sit down with my baby Einstein DVDs and my learning experiences and and it's actually one of the things that I put on Facebook was hurry is the enemy of love Mm. and so if we're in a big rush to pick them up and race home and do educational stuff with them that can be almost as bad because if they're basically quite stressed from their day at the daycare center what they really need is to really chill out and even perhaps put on a few tantrums and be a bit stroppy and difficult because they need to let go of some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you have to, um, if your life is busy, then try and make home a place that isn't busy, um, where everyone just, you, know, you don't have a lot of media happening and you just sit about a lot and and don't rush to cook nourishing meals and all that sort of stuff. Just just say, right, we're home, let's have baked beans. And, and, um, and, and everyone let their hair down. And this is the best thing because if it, a child can only be as relaxed as their parents, mm. and so we have this strange kind of paradox. So what they really need is for us to be just hanging loose and 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 being a bit of fun and a few cuddles and some quiet mm. time and. and yeah. <laughs> I think I think that takes a lot of pressure off parents as well. We live in such a, a stressful environment, don't we? We just we don't want to start getting our, our little toddlers and our, our, our young children stressed from from such a young That's age. That's right. Mm. Steve, it has been such a delight uh, having you on the show. Your expertise, your explanations, your your gentle way. It's it's really really lovely, and I I, I really speak on behalf of of the audience just to thank you for your time and and for for sharing. All, all that you have. I wish we had had more time. It's, it's been it, it a true just, pleasure. It, it just flew by and, and, and my love and hugs to people in all those exciting parts of South Africa that are listening. Good on you and nice to talk to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Take care. That was uh, Steve Bidoff, world-renowned psychologist, best-selling author. So raising boys, I mean, this is something that I read a while ago and I just found so beneficial. He's just written Raising Girls. So if it's girls that you have, go and get the book. Then, of course, the complete secrets of happy children and so much more visiting the Facebook pages. I really do hope that you learn something. Um, We take these roles very seriously, being parents in the business world, in our marriage, in our relationship, and sometimes 
sometimes we just need to relax, as Steve says, which, which I quite enjoy. So I thank you so much for tuning in. Hope those few little bits of, of wisdom and ideas will, will help you in your wonderful journey of parenting. And I do encourage you, please do visit that website, www.conversationswithnikki.co.za. Nikki spelled N-I-K-I, and it's one word. The podcast of the show will be there. You can go on to Facebook and Twitter as well. Look after yourself until next week. From me, Nikki Seberini. Goodbye. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Study apps. .co.za Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by studyapps.co.za South Africa's leading education app for tablets.